There you go. All right. Oh. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another edition of Spooky Sundays. Uh, today we're going to be finishing We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. And yeah, I'm pretty sure I'll get through all of it. It's only three more chapters, I think. And next week we'll be starting with some Lovecraft as per a request from a friend. Come by again next week and we'll start something new. Chapter 8. I had to go back for dinner. It was vital that I sit at the dinner table with Constance and Uncle Julian and Charles. It was unthinkable that they should sit there, eating their dinner and talking and passing food to one another and see my place empty. As Jonas and I came along the path through the garden in the in the gathering darkness, I looked at the house with all the richness of love I contained. It was a good house, and soon it would be cleaned and fair again. <sighs> Stopped for a minute, looking, and Jonas brushed my leg and spoke softly in curiosity. I'm looking at our house, I told him, and he stood quietly beside me, looking up with me. The roof pointed firmly against the sky and the walls met one another compactly, and the windows shone darkly. It was a good house, and nearly clean. There was light from the kitchen window, and from the windows of the dining room. It was time for their dinner, and I must be there. I wanted to be inside the house, with the door shut behind me. When I opened the kitchen door to go inside, I could feel at once that the house still held anger, and I wondered that anyone could keep one emotion so long. I could hear his voice clearly from the kitchen, going on and on. Must be done about her, he was saying. Things simply cannot continue like this. Poor Constance, I thought, having to listen and listen and watch the food getting cold. Jonas ran ahead of me into the dining room and Constance said, here she is. I stood in the dining room doorway and looked carefully for a minute. Constance was wearing pink and her hair was combed back nicely. She smiled at me when I looked at her, and I knew she was tired of listening. Uncle Julian's wheelchair was pushed up tight against the table, and I was sorry to see that Constance had tucked his napkin under his chin. It was too bad that Uncle Julian should not be allowed to eat freely. He was eating meatloaf and peas, which Constance had preserved once one fragrant summer day. Constance had cut the meatloaf into small pieces, and Uncle Julian mashed meat meatloaf and peas with the back of his spoon and stirred them before trying to get them into his mouth. He was not listening, but the voice went on and on. So you decided to come back again, did you? And high time too, young lady. Your sister and I have been trying to decide how to teach you a lesson. Wash your face, Mary Cat, Constance said gently, and comb your hair. We do not want you untidy at the dinner table, and your cousin Charles is very angry with you. Charles pointed his fork at me. I may as well tell you, Mary, that your tricks are over for good. Your sister and I have decided we have just that we have had exactly enough of hiding and the hiding and the destroying and the temper. Disliked having a fork pointed at me, and I disliked the voice of the, of the sound of the voice never stopping. I wished he would put food on the fork and put it in his mouth and strangle himself. Run along, Mary Cat, Constance said. Your dinner will be cold. She knew I would not eat dinner sitting at the table, and she would bring me my dinner in the kitchen afterwards, but I thought that she did not want to remind Charles of that, and so to give him one more thing to talk about. I smiled at her and went down the hall, with the voice still talking behind me. There had not been this many words sounded in our house for a long time, and it was going to take a while to clean them out. I walked heavily, going up the stairs so that they could hear that I was surely going up, but when I reached the top, I went softly as Jonas behind me. Constance had cleaned up the room where he was living. It looked very empty, because all she had done was take things out. She had nothing to put back because I carried all of it in the attic. I knew the dresser drawers were empty, and the closet and the bookshelves. There was no mirror, and a broken watch and a smashed chain lay atop the dresser. Constance had taken away the wet bedding, and I suppose she had dried and turned the mattress because the bed was made up again. 
The long curtains were gone, perhaps to be washed. He had been lying on the bed because it had been disarranged, and his pipe, still burning, lay on the table bed beside on the table beside the bed. I supposed that he had been lying there when Constance called him to dinner, and I wondered if he had looked around and around the altered room, trying to find something familiar, hoping that perhaps the angle of the closet door or the light on the ceiling would bring everything back to him. I was sorry that Constance had to turn the mattress alone. I usually helped her, but perhaps he had come and offered to do it for her. She had even brought a, him a clean saucer for his pipe. Our house did not have ashtrays, and when he kept trying to find places to put down his pipe, Constance had brought a chip, set of chipped saucers from the pantry shelf and given them to him to hold his pipe. The saucers were pink, with gold leaves around the rim. They were from a set older than any I remembered. Who used them? I asked Constance when she brought them into the kitchen. Where are their cups? I've never seen them used. They come from a time before I was in the kitchen. Some great grandmother brought with them, brought them with her dowry, and they were used and broken and replaced and finally put away at the top shelf of the pantry. There are only these saucers and dinner plates. They belong in the pantry, I said, not put around the house. Constance had been giving them to Charles, and now they were scattered instead of spending their little time decently put away on a shelf. There was one in the drawing room, and one in the dining room, and one, I suppose, in the study. They were not fragile, because one now in the bedroom had not cracked, although the pipe on it was still burning. I had known all day that I would find something here, and I brushed the saucer and the pipe off the table into the wastebasket, and they fell softly onto the newspapers he had brought into the house. I was wondering about my eyes. One of my eyes, the left, saw everything golden and yellow and orange, and the other saw shades of blue and gray and green. Perhaps one eye was for daylight and the other was for night. If everyone in the world saw different colors from different eyes, there might be a great new many colors to still be invented. I had reached the staircase to go downstairs before I remembered I had to go back to wash and comb my hair. What took you so long? He, sat, he asked when I sit down at the table. Have you been? What have you been doing up there? Will you make me a cake with pink frosting? I asked Constance, with little gold leaves around the edge. Jonas and I are going to have a party. Perhaps tomorrow, Constance said. We are going to have a long talk after dinner, Charles said. Solanum Dulcamara. I, asked, I told him. What? he said. Deadly nightshade, Constance said. Charles, please let it wait. I've had enough, he said. Constance? Yes, Uncle Julian. I have cleaned my plate. Uncle Julian found a morsel of meatloaf on his napkin and put it in his mouth. What do I have now? Perhaps a little more, Uncle Julian. It is a pleasure to see you so hungry. I feel considerably better tonight. I have not felt so hearty for days. I was pleased that Uncle Julian was well, and I knew he was happy because he had been so discourteous to Charles. While Constance was cutting up another small piece of meatloaf, Uncle Julian looked at Charles with an evil shine in his old eyes, and I knew he was going to say something wicked. Young man, he began at last, but Charles turned his head suddenly to the hall. Smell smoke! Charles said. Constance paused and lift her head, lifted her head and turned to the kitchen door. The stove? She said, and she got up quickly to go to the kitchen. Young man, there is certainly smoke. Charles went to look in the hall. I smell it out here. I wondered whom he thought he was talking to. Constance was in the kitchen, and Uncle Julian was thinking about what he was going to say, and I had stopped listening. There is smoke, Charles said. Well, it's not the stove, Const said Constance, standing in the kitchen doorway and looking at Charles. Charles turned and came closer to me. This is anything you've done, he said. And I laughed, because it was clear that Charles was afraid to go upstairs and follow the smoke. And then Constance said, Charles, your pipe! And, turned and, he, and he turned and ran up the stairs. I've asked him and asked him, Constance said. Would it start a fire? I asked her. And then Charles screamed from upstairs. 
Screamed, I thought, the exact sound of a blue jay in the woods. That's Charles, I said politely to Constance as she hurried up to go up into the hall and look. What is it, she said. Charles, what is it? Fire, Charles said, crashing down the stairs. Run, run, your whole damn house is on fire. <clears throat> and you haven't got a phone. My papers, Uncle Julian said. I shall collect my papers and remove them to a place of safety. And he pushed against the edge of the table to move his chair away. Constance, run, Charles said, as and at the front door now, wrenching at the lock. Run, you fool. I have not done much running in the past few years, young man. I see no cause for this hysteria. There is time to gather my papers. Charles had the front door open now, and turned on, turned on the door sill to call to Constance. Don't try to carry the safe, he said. Put the money in a bag. I'll be back as fast as I can with help. Don't panic. And he ran, and we could hear him screaming, Fire! 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 as he ran into the village. Good heavens, Constance said, almost amused. Then she took Uncle Julian's chair to help him to his room, and I went into the hall and looked upstairs. Charles had left the door to our father's room standing open, and I could see the movement of the fire inside. Fire burns upward, I thought. It will burn their things in the attic. Charles had left the front door open too, and the line of smoke reached down the stairs and drifted outside. I did not see any need to move quickly or to run shrieking around the house because the fire did not seem to be hurrying. I wondered if I could go upstairs and shut the door to our father's room and keep the fire inside, belonging entirely to Charles. But when I started up the stairs, I saw a finger of flame reach out to touch the hall carpet, and some heavy object fell crashing in our father's room. There would be nothing of Charles in there now, even his pipe must have been consumed. Uncle Julian is gathering his papers, Constance said, coming into the hall to stand beside me. She had Uncle Julian's shawl over her arm. We will have to go outside, I said. I knew that she was frightened, so I said, We can stay on the porch, behind the vines in the darkness. We needn't it just the other day, she said. It has no right to burn. She began to shiver as though she were angry. I took her by the hand and brought her through the front open door, and just as we turned back for another look, the lights came into our driveway, a disgusting noise of sirens, and we were held in the doorway in the light. Constance put her face against me to hide, and there was Jim Donnell, the first one to leap out of the fire engine and run up the steps. Out of the way, he said, he pushed past us into our house. I took Constance along the porch to the corner where the vines grew thick she moved into the corner and pressed against the vines. I held her hand tight, and together we watched the great feet of the men slipping across our door sill, dragging their hoses, bringing filth and confusion and danger into our house. More lights moved in the driveway and up the steps, and the front of the house was white and pale and uncomfortable at being so clearly visible. It had never been lighted before. The noise was too much for me to hear altogether. But somewhere in the noise was Charles's voice, still going on and on. Get the safe in the study, he said a thousand times. <laughs> Smoke squeezed out the front door, coming between the big men pushing in. Constance, I whispered. Constance, don't watch them. Can they see me? She whispered back. Is anyone looking? They're all watching the fire. Be very quiet. I looked carefully out between the vines. There was a long row of cars and the village fire engine, all parked close to the houses they could get. And everyone in the village was there, looking up and watching. And I saw faces laughing, faces that looked frightened. And then someone called out very near to us. What about the women and the old man? Anyone see them? They had plenty of warning, Charles shouted from somewhere. They're all right. Uncle Julian could manage his chair well enough to get out the back door, I thought, but it did not seem that the fire was going near the kitchen or Uncle Julian's room. I could see the hoses and hear the men shouting, and they were all on the stairs and in the front bedrooms upstairs. I could not get through the front door, 
and even if I could leave Constance, there was no way to go around the back door without going down into the steps into the light with all of them watching. Was Uncle Julian frightened? I whispered to Constance. I think he was annoyed, she said. A few minutes later, she said, it will take a great deal of scrubbing to get that hall clean again, and sighed. And I was pleased that she thought of the house and forgot the people outside. Jonas, I said to her, where is he? I could see her smile a little in the darkness of the vines. He was annoyed too, she said. He went out the back door, and when I took Uncle Julian to get his papers. We were all right. Uncle Julian might well forget that there was a fire at all, if he became interested in his papers, and Jonas was almost certainly watching from the shadow of the trees. When they were finished putting out Charles's fire, I could take Constance back inside and we could start to clean the house again. Constance was quieter, although more and more cars came through the driveway and the unending patter of feet went back and forth across our door sill, except for Jim Donald, who wore a hat proclaiming him chief. It was impossible to identify any one person, and more than that, it was impossible to put a name to any of the faces in front of our house, looking up and laughing at the fire. I tried to think clearly. The house was burning. There was fire inside our house. But Jim Donnell and the other anonymous men in hats and raincoats were curiously able to destroy the fire which was running through the bones of our house. It was Charles's fire. When I listened particularly for the fire, I could hear it singing. I could hear it. A singeing hot noise upstairs. But over and around it, smothering, were the voices of men inside and the voices of the people watching outside and the distant sound of cars on the driveway. Next to me, Constance was standing quietly, sometimes looking at the men going into the house, but more often covering her eyes with her hands. She was excited, I thought, but not in any danger. Every now and then, it was possible to hear one voice raised above the others. Jim Donnell shouted some words of instruction, or someone in the crowd called out. Why not let it burn? A woman's voice came loudly, laughing. Get the safe out of the study downstairs. And that was Charles, safely in the crowd out front. Why not let it burn? The woman called insistently. And one of the dark men going in and out of the front door turned back and waved and grinned. We're the firemen, he called back. We gotta put it out. Let it burn, the woman called. Smoke was everywhere, thick and ugly. Sometimes when I looked out at the faces of people were clouded with smoke, and it came out the front door in frightening waves. Once there was a crash from inside the house, and the voices speaking quickly and urgently, and the faces outside turned up happily in the smoke, mouths open. Get the safe, Charles cried out wild wildly. Two or three of you men, get the safe out of the study, the whole house is going. Let it burn, the old woman cried. <laughs> I was hungry, and I wanted my dinner, and I wondered how long they could make the fire last before they put it out and went away, and Constance and I could go back inside. <laughs> One or two of the village boys had edged onto the porch dangerously close to where we stood, but they only looked inside, not at the porch, and tried to stand on their toes and see past the firemen and the hoses. I was tired and I wished it would all be over. I realized then that the light was lessening and the faces on the lawn less distinct and a new tone came in the noise. Voices inside were surer, less sharp, almost pleased, and the voices outside were lower and disappointed. It's going out, someone said. Under control, another added. Did a lot of damage though, and there was laughter. Sure made a mess of the old place. Should have burned it down years ago. And them in it. They mean us, I thought. Constance and me. Say, anybody seen them? No such luck. Firemen threw them out. That's too bad. The light was almost gone. People outside stood now in the shadows, their faces narrowed and dark, with only the headlights of cars to light them. I saw the flash of a smile, and somewhere else a hand raised to wave, and the voices went on regretfully. Just about over. Pretty good fire. 
Jim Donnell came through the front door. Everyone knew him because of his size and his hat that said Chief. Say, Jim, someone called. Why don't you let it burn? He lift his bo lifted both of his hands to make everyone quiet. Fire's all out, folks, he said. Very carefully, he put up his hands and took off his hat, saying Chief. And while everyone watched, he walked away slowly down the steps and over to the fire engine and set his hat down on the front seat. Then he bent down, searching thoughtfully, and finally, while everyone watched, he took up a rock. In complete silence, he turned slowly and raised his arm and smashed a rock through one of the great tall windows of our mother's drawing room. A wall of laughter rose and grew behind him, and then, first the boys on the steps, and then the other men, and at last the women and smaller children, they moved like a wave at our house. Constance, I said. Constance! But her hands were over her eyes. The other of the drawing room windows crashed, this time from inside, and I saw that it had been shattered by the lamp, which always stood by Constance's chair in the drawing room. Above it all, most horrible, was the laughter. I saw one of the Dresden figurines thrown and break against the porch rail, and the others fell unbroken and rolled across the grass. I heard Constance's harp go over with a musical cry and a sound which I knew was a chair being smashed against a wall. Listen, Charles said from somewhere, will a couple of you guys help with the safe? And then, through the laughter, someone began. <laughs> Mary Cat said Constance, would you like a cup of tea? And it was rhythmic and insistent. I am on the moon, I thought. Please let me be on the moon. And then I heard the sound of dishes smashing. And at that minute, I realized that we stood outside the tall windows of the dining room. They were coming very close. Constance, I said, we have to run. She shook her head, hands over her face. They'll find us in a minute. Please, Constance, dearest, run with me. I can't, she said. And from just inside the dining room window, a shout went up. Mary Cat said, Constance, would you like to go to sleep? And I pulled Constance away, and a second before the window went, I thought a chair had been thrown towards it. <clears throat> I pulled Constance away, a second before the window went. I thought a chair had been thrown through it. Perhaps the dining room chair where our father used to sit, and Charles used to sit. Hurry, I said, no longer able to be quiet in all that noise. And pulling Constance by the hand, I ran towards the step. As we came into the light, she threw Uncle Julian's shawl over her face to hide it. A little girl ran out of the front door carrying something, her mother behind her. Caught her by the back of the dress and slapped her hands. Don't you put that stuff in your mouth, Constance, her mother screamed, and the little girl dropped a handful of Constance's spice cookies. Mary Cat said, Constance, would you like a cup of tea? Mary Cat said, Constance, would you like to go to sleep? Oh no, said Mary Cat, you'll poison me. We had to go down the steps and into the woods to be safe. It was not far, but the headlights of the cars shone across the lawn. I wondered if Constance would slip and fall, running through the light, but we had to get to the woods, and there was no other way. We hesitated near the steps, neither one of us quite daring to go any farther, but the windows were broken and inside they were throwing our dishes and our glasses and our silverware and even the pots Constance used in cooking. I wondered if my stool in the corner of the kitchen had been smashed yet. While we stood still for a last minute, a car came up the driveway and another behind it, and they swung to a stop in front of the house, sending more light onto the lawn. What the holy devil is going on here? Jim Clark said, rolling out of the first car and Helen Clark on the other side opened her mouth and stared. Shouting and pushing and not seeing us at all, Jim Clark made his way through our door and into the house. What in the holy goddamn devil is going on here? He kept saying, and outside Helen Clark never saw us, but only stared at our house. Crazy fools, Jim Clark yelled inside. Crazy drunken fools. Dr. Levy came out of the second car and hurried towards the house. Has everyone gone crazy in here? Jim Clark was saying from inside, and there was a shout of laughter. Would you like a cup of tea? Someone inside screamed, and they laughed. 
Ought to bring it down brick by brick, someone inside said. The doctor came up the steps running and pushed us aside without looking. Where's Julian Blackwood? He asked a woman in the doorway. And the woman said, down in the boneyard, ten feet deep. It was time. I took Constance tightly by the hand, and we started carefully down the steps. I would not run yet, because I was afraid that Constance might fall. So I brought her slowly down the steps. No one could see us yet, except Helen Clark as she stared at the house. Behind us, I heard Jim Clark shouting. He was trying to make the people leave our house, and before we reached the bottom steps, there were voices behind us. Here they are, someone shouted, and I think it was Stella. There they are, there they are, there they are! And I started to run, but Constance stumbled, and when they were all around us, pushing and laughing and trying to get close to see. Constance held Uncle Julian's shawl across her face so they could not look at her, and for a minute we stood very still, pressed together by the feeling of people all around us. Put them back in the house and start the fire all over again. We fixed things up nice for you girls, just like you always wanted it. Mary Cat said Constance, would you like a cup of tea? For a terrible minute, I thought that they were going to join hands and dance around us singing. I saw Helen Clark far away, pressed, again, pressed hard against the side of her car. She was crying and saying something, and even though I could not hear through the noise, I knew she was saying, I want to go home. Please, I want to go home. Mary Cat said Constance, would you like to go to sleep? And they were trying not to touch us. Whenever I turned, they fell back a little. Once, between two shoulders, I caught Harler up the junkyard, wandering across the porch of our house, picking up little things and setting them to one side in a pile. I moved a little, holding Constance's hand tight. And as they fell back, we ran suddenly towards the trees. But Jim Donald's wife and Mrs. Mueller came out in front of us, laughing and holding out their arms, and we stopped and I turned. And I gave Constance a little pull and we ran. But Stella and the Harris boys crossed in front of us, laughing, and the Harris boys shouting, Down in the boneyard, ten feet deep! And we stopped. And then I turned toward the house, running again, with Constance pulled behind me, and Albert the grocer and his greedy wife were there, holding their hands to halt us, almost dancing together, and we stopped. I went then to the side, and Jim Donald stepped in front of us, and we stopped. Oh no, said Mary Cat, you'll poison me, Jim Donald said politely, and they came around us again, circling and keeping carefully out of their reach. Mary Cat said, Constance, would you like to go to sleep? And over it all was the laughter. Almost drowning the singing and the shouting and the howling was the Harris boys. Mary Cat said, Constance, would you like a cup of tea? Constance held to me with one hand, and with the other she kept Uncle Julian's shawl across her face. I saw an opening in the circle around us, and we ran again for the trees, but all the Harris boys were there. One on the ground with laughter, and we stopped. I turned again and ran for the house, but Stella came forward, and we stopped. Constance was stumbling, and I wondered if we were going to fall on the ground in front of them, lying there where they might step on us in their dancing. And I stood still. I could not pos possibly let Constance fall in front of them. <sighs> That's all now, Jim Clark said from the porch. His voice was not loud, but they all heard. That's enough, he said. There was a small polite silence, and then someone said, Down in the boneyard, ten feet deep. And the laughter rose. Listen to me, Jim Clark said, raising his voice. Listen to me, Julian Blackwood is dead. Then they were quiet at last. After a minute, Charles Blackwood said from the crowd around us, Did she kill him? They went back from us now, moving slowly in small steps, withdrawing until there was a wide space ar around us and Constance standing clearly with Uncle Julian's shawl over her face. Did she kill him? Charles Blackwood asked again. She did not, said the doctor, standing in the doorway. Julian died as I always known he would. He'd been waiting quite a long time. Now go quietly, Jim Clark said. He began to take people by the shoulders. 
pushing a little at their backs, turning them towards their cars in the driveway. Go quickly, he said. There has been a death in this house. It was so quiet, in spite of many people moving across the grass and going away, that I heard Helen Clark say, Poor Julian. I took a cautious step towards the darkness, holding Constance a little so that she followed me. Art, the doctor said to us on the front porch, and I went another step. No one turned to look at us. Car doors slammed softly and motors started. I looked back once. My little group was standing around the doctor on the steps. Most of the lights were turned away, heading down the driveway. And when I felt the shadows of the trees fall on us, I moved quickly. One last step and we were inside. Pulling Constance, I hurried under the trees in the darkness, and I felt my feet leave the grass on the lawn and touch the soft mossy ground of the path of things in the woods, and knew that the trees had closed in around us, and I stopped and I put my arms around Constance. It's all over, I told her, and held her tight. It's all right. It's all right now. I knew my way in the darkness or in the light. I thought once how good it was that I had straightened my hiding place and freshened it, so now it would be pleasant for Constance. I would cover her with leaves, like children in a story, and keep her safe and warm. Perhaps I would sing to her or tell her stories. I would bring her bright fruits and berries and a water in a leaf cup. And someday we would go to the moon. I found the entrance to my hiding place and let Constance in. And I took her to the corner where there was a fresh pile of leaves and a blanket. I pushed her gently until she sat down. And I took Uncle Julian's shawl away from her and I covered her with it. A little purr came from the corner and I knew Jonas had been waiting for me here. I put the branches across the entrance. Even if they came with lights, they could not see us. It was not entirely dark, and I could see the, the shadow that was Constance, and when I put my head back, I saw two or three stars shining from far away between the leaves and the branches down over my head. One of our mother's Dresden figurines is broken, I thought, I said, and I said aloud to Constance. I'm going to put a death in all their food and watch them die. Constance stirred and the leaves rustled. The way you did before, she asked. It had never been spoken of between us, not once in six years. Yes, I said, the way I did before. Again, I'm so sorry that it keeps cutting out and whoever is still here, thank you for bearing with me. I'm really trying to figure it out and apologies for my cold and I'm gonna blow my nose real quick. I really am trying to figure what this is, but it's just not working. several beverages for good luck. All right. <clears throat> Chapter 9. Sometime during the night, an ambulance came and took Uncle Julian away, and I wondered if they missed his shawl, which was wound around Constance as she slept. Saw the ambulance lights turning into the driveway, and the small red light on top, and I heard the distant sounds of Uncle Julian's leaving, and the voices speaking gently because they knew they were in the presence of the dead, and the doors opening and closing. They called to us two or three times, perhaps to ask if they might have Uncle Julian, but their voices were subdued, and no one came into the woods. I sat by the creek, wishing that I had been kinder to Uncle Julian. 
Uncle Julian had believed I was dead, and now he was dead himself. Bow your heads to our beloved Mary Catherine, I thought, or you will be dead. Oh, sorry, just a minute. The water moved sleepily in the darkness, and I wondered what kind of a house we would have now. Perhaps the fire had destroyed everything, and we would go back tomorrow and find that the past six years had been burned away, and they were waiting for us, sitting around the dinner t dining room table, waiting for Constance to bring them their dinner. Perhaps we would find ourselves in the Rochester house, or living in the village, or on a houseboat on the river, or in a tower on top of a hill. Perhaps the fire might have been might have persuaded to reverse itself and abandon our house and destroy the village instead. Perhaps the villagers were all dead now. Perhaps the village really was a great game board with all the squares neatly marked out. And I had been moved past the square which read, Fire, return to start. And was now on the last few squares, with only one move to go before we reach home. Jonas's fur smelled of smoke. Today was Helen Clark's day to come to tea. There would be no tea today, because we would have to neaten the house, and although it was not the usual day for neatening the house. I wished the Constance had made sandwiches for us to bring down to the creek, and I wondered if Helen Clark would try to come to tea, even though the house was not ready. I decided from now on that I would not be allowed to hand teacups. When the fire first began to to get light, excuse me. When it first began to get light, I heard Constance stirring in the leaves, and I went to my hiding place near her when she awakened. When she opened her eyes, she looked first at the trees above her and then at me and smiled. We're on the moon at last, I told her, and she smiled. I thought I dreamed it all, she said. It really happened. Poor Uncle Julian. They came in the night and they took him away, and we stayed here on the moon. Well, I'm glad to be here, she said. Thank you for bringing me. There were leaves in her hair and dirt on her face, and Jonas, who had followed me into my hiding place, had stared at her in surprise. He had never seen Constance with a dirty face before. For a minute she was quiet no longer smiling, looking back at Jonas and realizing that she was dirty. And then she said, Mary Cat, what are we going to do? First, we must neaten the house, even though it's not the usual day. The house? Oh, Mary Cat! I had no dinner last night, I told her. Oh, <laughs> Mary Cat. She sat up and untangled herself quickly from Uncle Julian's shawl and the leaves. Oh, Mary Cat, poor baby, we'll hurry. And she scrambled to her feet. First, you better wash your face. She went to the creek and I wet her handkerchief and scrubbed at her face while I shook out Uncle Julian's shawl and folded it, thinking how strange and backward everything was this morning. I had never touched Uncle Julian's shawl before. I already saw that the rules were going to be different, but it was odd to be folding Uncle Julian's shawl. Later, I thought, I would come back here to my usual hiding place and clean it and put in fresh leaves. Mary Cat, you'll starve. We'll have to watch, I said, taking her hand to slow her. We have to go very quietly and carefully. Some of them may still be around, waiting. I went first down the path, walking silently, with Constance and Jonas behind me. Constance could not step as silently as I could, but she made very little sound, and of course Jonas made no sound at all. I took the path that would bring us out of the woods and back to the house, near the vegetable garden, and when I came to the edge of the woods, I stopped, and I held Constance back while we looked carefully to see if there were any of them left. For one minute, we saw only the garden and the kitchen door, looking just as always, 
And then Constance gasped and said, Oh, Mary Cat, she said with a little moan. And I held myself very still because the top of our house was gone. I remembered that I stood looking at our house with love yesterday and thought how it had always been so tall, reaching up to the trees. Today the house ended above the kitchen doorway in a nightmare of black and twisted wood. And I saw part of the window frame still holding broken glass and thought that was my window. And I looked out that window from my room. There was no one there, no sound. We moved together very slowly toward the house, trying to understand its ugliness and ruin and shame. I saw that ash had drifted among the vegetable plants, and the lettuce would have to be washed before I could eat it, and the tomatoes. No fire had come this way, but everything, the grass and the apple trees and the marble bench in Constance's garden had an air of smokiness and everything was dirty. As we came closer to the house, we saw more clearly that the fire had not reached the ground floor had to be content with the bedrooms in the attic. Constance hesitated at the kitchen door, but she opened it a thousand times before and ought surely to recognize the touch of her hand, so she took the latch up and lifted it. The house seemed to shiver when she opened the door, although one more draft could hardly chill it now. Constance had to push at the door to make it open, but no burned timber came crashing down. And there was not, as I half thought there might be, a sudden rush of falling together, as the house, seemingly solid but really made only of ash, might dissolve at a touch. My kitchen, Constance said, my kitchen. And she stood in the doorway looking. I thought that we had somehow not found our way back correctly through the night, and that we had somehow lost ourselves and come back through the wrong gap in time, or the wrong door, or the wrong fairy tale. Constance put her hand against the door frame to steady herself and said, again, My kitchen, Mary Cat. My stool is still here, I said. The obstacle which made the door hard to open was the kitchen table, turned on its side. I set it upright and we went inside. Two of the chairs had been smashed and the floor was horrible with broken dishes and glasses and broken boxes of food and paper torn from the shelves. Jars of jam and syrup and ketchup had been scattered against the walls. The sinks were where Constance washed her dishes were filled with broken glass, and all <clears throat> as though glass after glass had been broken there methodically, one after another. Drawers of silverware and cookingware had been pulled out and broken against the table and the walls and silverware that had been our house for generations of black wives was lying bent and scattered on the floor. Tablecloths and napkins hemmed by blackwood women and washed and ironed again and again, and mended and cherished, had been ripped from the dining room sideboard and dragged across the kitchen. It seemed that all the wealth and hidden treasure of our house had been found out and torn and soiled. I saw broken plates which had come from the top shelves in the cupboard and our little sugar bowl with the roses lay, al lay almost at my feet, handles gone. Constance bent down and picked up a silver spoon. This was our grandmother's wedding pattern, she said, and she set the spoon on the table. Then she said, the preserves, and turned to the cellar door. It was closed and I had hoped they had not seen it, or perhaps had not had the time to go down the stairs. Constance picked her way carefully across the floor and opened the cellar door and looked down. I thought of the jars and jars so beautifully preserved, lying in broken, sticky heaps in the cellar, but Constance went down a step or two and said, No, it's all right. Nothing here has been touched. She closed the cellar door again and made her way across, the sink, across to the sink to wash her hands and dry them on a dish towel from the floor. First your breakfast, she said. Jonas sat on the doorstep in the growing sunlight, looking in the kitchen with astonishment. Once he raised his eyes to me, and I wondered if he thought that Constance and I had made this mess. I saw a cup was not broken, and I picked it up and set it on the table, and then thought to look for more things which might have escaped. I remembered that one of our mother's Dresden figurines had rolled safely onto the grass, and I wondered if it had hidden successfully and preserved itself. 
I'd look for it later. Excuse me a moment. <sighs> nothing was orderly. Nothing was planned. It was not like any, any other day. Once Constance went into the cellar and came back with her arms full. Vegetable soup, she said, almost singing, and strawberry jam and chicken soup and pickled beef. She set the jars on the kitchen table and turned slowly, looking down at the floor. There, she said at last, and she went to a corner to pick up a small saucepan. Then on a sudden thought, she set down the saucepan and made her way into the pantry. Merry cat, she called with laughter. They didn't find the flour in the barrel, or the salt, or the potatoes. They found the sugar, I thought. The floor was gritty and almost alive under my feet. And I thought, of course, they would go looking through the sugar and have a lovely time. Perhaps they had thrown handfuls of sugar at one at another, screaming, Blackwood sugar, Blackwood sugar, want a taste? They got into the pantry shelves, Constance went on. The cereals and the spices and the canned foods. I walked slowly around the kitchen, looking at the floor. I thought that they had probably tumbled things by the armloads, because cans of food were scattered and bent, as though they had been tossed into the air, and boxes of cereal and tea and crackers had been trampled underfoot and broken open. The tins of spices were all together, thrown into a corner unopened. I thought I could still s smell the faint spice of I thought I could still smell the faint spicy scent of Constance's cookies and then saw some of them crushed on the floor. Constance came out of the pantry, carrying a loaf of bread. Look what they didn't find, she said, and there are eggs and milk and butter in the cooler. And since they had not found the cellar door, they had not found the cooler just inside, and I was pleased that they had not discovered eggs to mix into the mess on the floor. At one time, I found three unbroken chairs, and set them where they had belonged around the table. Jonah sat in my corner on my stool, watching us, and I drank chicken soup from a cup without a handle, and Constance watched, washed a knife to spread butter on the bread. And although I did not perceive it then, time and the orderly pattern of our old days had ended. And I do not know when I found the three chairs and when I ate the buttered bread, whether I had found the chairs and then eaten the bread, or whether I had eaten it first or done both at once. Once Constance turned suddenly and put down the knife, she started to for Once Constance turned suddenly and put down her knife, she started for the closed door to Uncle Julian's room and then turned back, smiling a little. Thought I heard him walking, she said, and sat down again. We had not yet been out of the kitchen. We still did not know how much of the house was left to us or what we might find waiting beyond the closed doors in the dining room and the hall. We sat quietly in the kitchen, grateful for the chairs and the chicken soup and the sunlight coming through the doorway, not yet ready to go further. What will they do with Uncle Julian? I asked. They will have a funeral, Constance said with sadness. Do you remember the others? I was in the orphanage, said. They let me go to the funerals of the others. I can remember. They will have a funeral for Uncle Julian, and the Clarks will go, and the Carringtons, and certainly Mrs. Wright. They will tell each other how sorry they are. They will look to see if we are there. I felt them looking to see if we were there, and I shivered. They will bury him with the others. I would like to bury something for Uncle Julian, I said. Constance was quiet, looking at her fingers, which lay still and long across the table. Uncle Julian is gone, and the others, she said. Most of our house is gone, Mary Cat. We are all that is left. Jonas. Jonas, we are going to lock ourselves in more securely than ever. 
but today is the day that Helen Clark comes to tea. No, she said. Not again. Not here. Uh. As long as we sat quietly together in the kitchen, it was possible to postpone seeing the rest of the house. The library books were still on their shelf untouched, and I supposed that no one had wanted to touch books belonging to the library. There was a fine, after all, for destroying library property. Constance, who was always dancing, seemed now unwilling to move. She sat on the kitchen table with her hands spread before her, not looking around at the destruction, and almost dreaming, as though she had never believed that she had wakened at all this morning. We must meet in the house, I said to her uneasily, and she smiled across at me. When I felt that I could not wait for her any longer, I said, I'm going to look. And I got up and went to the dining room door. She watched me, not moving. When I opened the door to the dining room, there was a shocking smell of wetness and burned wood and destruction, and glass from the tall windows lay across the floor, and the silver tea service that had been, the silver tea service had been swept off the sideboard and stamped into grotesque, unrecognizable shapes. Chairs were broken here too. I remember that they had taken up chairs and hurled them at the windows and the walls. I went through the dining room and into the front hall. The front door stood wide open and the early sunlight lay in patterns across the floor of the hall, touching broken glass and torn cloth. After a minute, I recognized the cloth as the drawing room draperies, which our mother had once made up 14 feet long. No one was outside. I stood in the open doorway and saw that the lawn was marked with the tires of the cars and the feet which had danced, and where, there, and where the hoses had gone, there were puddles and puddles of mud. The front porch was littered, I remembered. The front porch was littered, and I remembered the neat pile of partly broken furniture which Harler the junk dealer had set together last night. And I wondered if he planned to come today with a truck and gather up everything he could or if he had only put the pile together because he loved piling great piles of broken things and could not resist stacking junk wherever he found it. I waited in the doorway to be sure that no one was watching, and then I ran down the steps across the grass and found our mother's Dresden figurine, unbroken where it, hid, where it, it had hidden against the roots of a bush, and I thought to take it to Constance. She was, sit she was still sitting quietly at the kitchen table, and when I put the Dresden figurine down before her, she looked for a minute and then took it into her hands and held it against her cheek. It's all my fault, she said. Somehow it's all my fault. I love you, Constance, I said. And I love you too, Mary Cat. And will you make that little cake for Jonas and me? Pink frosting with the gold leaves around the edge? She shook her head. And for a minute I thought she was not going to answer me. And then she took a deep breath and stood up. First, I'm going to clean this kitchen. What are you going to do with that? I asked her, touching the Dresden figurine with the very tip of my finger. Put it back where it belongs, she said, and I followed her as she opened the door to the hall and made her way down the hall into the drawing room doorway. The hall was less littered than the rooms, because there had been less in it to smash, but there were fragments carried from the kitchen, and we stepped on the spoons and dishes which had been thrown here. I was shocked when we came into the drawing room to see our mother's portrait looking down on us graciously while her drawing room lay destroyed around her. The white wedding cake trim was blackened with smoke and soot and would never be clean again. I disliked seeing the drawing room even more than the kitchen or the dining room because we had always kept it so tidy, and our mother had loved this room. And I wondered which of them had pushed, Constance, pushed over Constance's heart, and I remembered that I had heard it cry out as it fell. The rose brocade on the chairs was torn and dirty, smudged with the marks of wet feet that had kicked at the chairs and stamped on the sofa. The windows were broken here too, and the drapes torn down were and with the drapes torn down, we were clearly visible from the outside. I think I can close the shutters, I said, as Constance hesitated in the doorway, 
unwilling to come further into the room. I stepped out onto the porch through the broken window, thinking that no one had ever come this way before, and found that I could unhook the shutters easily. The shutters were tall as the windows. Originally, it was intended that a man with a ladder would come to close the shutters when the summers were ended and the family went away to a city house. But so many years had passed since the shutters were closed that the hooks had been the hooks had rusted and I needed only to shake the heavy shutters to pull the hooks away from the house. I swung the shutters closed, but I could only reach the lower bolt to hold them. There were two more bolts high above my head. Perhaps some night I might come out here with a ladder, but the lower bolt would have to hold them now. After I had closed the shutters on both the tall drawing room windows, I went along the porch and in, finally through the front door, into the drawing room, where Constance stood in dimness now, without sunlight. Constance went to the mantel and set the Dresden figurine in its place below the portrait of our mother, and for one quick minute the great shadowy room came back together as it should be, and then fell apart again forever. We had to walk carefully because of the broken things on the floor. Our father's safe lay just inside the drawing room door, and I laughed, and even Constance smiled, because it had not been opened, and clearly not been possible to carry it any farther than this. Foolishness, Constance said, and touched the safe with her toe. Our mother had always been pleased when people admired her drawing room, but now no one would come to the windows and look in, and no one would ever see it again. Constance and I closed the drawing room door behind us and never opened it afterwards. Constance waited just outside the front door while I went onto the porch and I closed the shutters over the tall dining room windows. And then I came inside and we shut and locked the front door and we were safe. The hall was dark, with two narrow lines of sunlight coming through the two narrow glass panels set, either, set on either side of the door. We could look outside through the glass, but no one could see it, even by putting their eyes up close, because the hall inside was dark. Above us, the stairs were black and led into blackness or burned rooms, which incredibly tiny spots of sky shone through. Until now, the room was always hidden. Until now, the roof had always hidden us from the sky, but I did not think that there was any way we could be vulnerable from above. I closed my mind against the thought of silent winged creatures coming out of the trees above to perch on the broken, burnt rafters of our house, peering down. I thought it might be wise to barricade the stairs by putting something, a broken chair perhaps, across. A mattress, soaked and dirty, lay halfway down the stairs. This was where they had stood with the hoses and fought the fire back out. I stood at the foot of the stairs looking up, wondering where our house had gone. The walls and the floors and the beds and the boxes of things in the attic, our father's watch had burned away, and our mother's tortoiseshell dressing set. I could feel a breath of air on my cheek. It came from the sky I could see. But the smell but it smelled of smoke and ruin. Our house was a castle, turreted and open to the sky. Come back to the kitchen, said Constance. I can't stay here. Like children at hunting for shells, or two old ladies going through dead leaves looking for pennies, we shuffled along the kitchen floor with our feet, turning over broken trash to find the things that were still whole and useful. When we had been along and across and diagonally all through the kitchen, we had gathered together a little pile of practical things on the kitchen table. And there was quite enough for the two of us. There were two cups with handles, and several without, and a half dozen plates, and three bowls. We had been able to rescue all of the cans of food undamaged, and the cans of spice went neatly back onto the shelf. 
We found most of the silverware, and straightened most of it as well as we could, and put it back to its proper drawers. Since every Blackwood bride had brought her own silverware in China, and linen into the house, we had always had dozens of butter knives and soup ladles and cake servers. Our mother's best silverware had been in a tarnish-proof box in the, in the dining room sideboard, but they had found it and scattered it on the floor. One of our whole cups was green with a pale yellow inside, and Constance had said that that could be mine. Never saw anyone use it before, she said. I suppose a grandmother or a great great aunt brought it. Brought. I suppose a grandmother or a great great aunt brought that set to the house as her wedding china. There once was plates to match. The cup, the cup which Constance chose was white with orange flowers, and one of the plates matched that. I remember when we used those dishes, Constance said. These were everyday china when I was small. The china we used the best then was white with gold edges. Then mother brought the then mother brought new best china, and the white and gold china was used for every day, and these flower dishes were went onto the pantry shelf with the other half broken sets. These last few years I have always used mother's everyday china, except for when Helen Clark came to tea. We, are ta we will take our meals like ladies, she says, using cups with handles. When we had taken out everything we wanted and could use, Constance got the heavy broom and swept all the rubble into the dining room. Now we won't have to look at it, she said. She swept the hall clear so we could go from the kitchen to the front door without passing through the dining room. We closed up all the doors to the dining room and never opened them again. I thought of the Dresden figurine standing small and courageous under our mother's portrait in the dark drawing room, and I remembered that we would never dust it again. Before Constance swept away the torn cloth that had been the drawing room drapes, I asked her to cut me off a piece of cord which had once drawn them open and shut, and she cut me a piece with a golden tassel on one end, and I wondered if it might be the right thing to bury for Uncle Julian. When we had finished, and Constance had scrubbed the kitchen floor of our house looking clean and new, from the front door to the kitchen door, everything was clear and swept. So many things were gone from the kitchen that it looked bare, but Constance put our cups and plates and bowls on a shelf, and found a pan to give Jonas milk, and we were quite safe. The front door was locked, and the kitchen door was locked and bolted, and we were sitting at the kitchen table drinking milk from our two cups, and Jonas was drinking from his pan when a knocking started at the front door. Constance ran into the cellar, and I stopped just long enough to be sure that the kitchen door was bolted, and then I followed her. We sat on the cellar stairs in the darkness and listened. Far away at the front door, the knocking went on and on, and a voice called, Constance, Mary Catherine. Tell him Clark, Constance said in a whisper. Do you think she's come here for tea? No, never again. As we had both known she would, she came around the house calling us. When she knocked on the kitchen door, we held our breath, neither of us moving, because the top half of the kitchen door was glass. We knew she could see in, but we were safely on the cellar stairs and she could not open the door. Constance, Mary Catherine, are you in there? She shook the door handle as people do when they want a door to be open and think they can catch it unaware and slip in before the lock can hold. Jim, she said, I know they're in there. I can see something cooking on the stove. You've got to open the door, she said, raising her voice. Constance, come talk to me. I want to see you. Jim, she said, they're in there and they can hear me. I know it. I'm sure they can hear you, Jim Clark said. They can probably hear you in the village. I'm sure they misunderstood the people last night. I'm sure Constance was upset, but I must tell them that no one meant any harm. Constance, listen to me, please. We want you and Mary Catherine to come to our house until we can decide what to do with you. Everything's all right, it really is. We're going to forget all about it. Do you think she'll push over the house? I whispered to Constance, and Constance shook her head wordlessly. Certainly not. Jim, don't you think you could break down the door? 
Certainly not. Leave them alone, Helen. They'll come out when they're ready. But Constance takes these things so seriously, I'm sure she's frightened now. Leave them alone. They cannot be left alone. That is the absolutely the worst possible thing for them. I want them out here and home with me where I can take care of them. They don't seem to want to come, Jim Clark said. Constance, Constance, I know you're in there. Open the door. I was thinking that we might well push a cloth or a piece of cardboard over the window in the kitchen door. It simply would not do to have Helen Clark constantly peering in to watch pots cooking on the stove. We could pin the curtains together across the kitchen windows, and perhaps if the windows were all covered, you could sit quietly at the table while Helen Clark came pounding outside and not have to hide on the cellar stairs. Let's leave, Jim Clark said. They're not going to answer you. But I want to take them home with me. We did what we could. We'll come back another time, when they feel more like seeing you. Constance, Constance, please answer me. Constance sighed, tapping her fingers irritably and almost noiselessly on the stair rail. Wish she'd hurry, she said to my ear. The soup's gonna boil over. Helen Clark called again and again, going around, back around the house into their car, calling Constance, Constance, as though we might be somewhere near the woods, up in a tree perhaps, or under the lettuce leaves, or perhaps waiting to spring out at her from behind a bush. When we heard the car start distantly, we came, out up the, we came up out of the cellar, and Constance turned off her soup, and I went along the hall to the front door to be sure they had gone, and that the door was safely locked. I saw their car turn out the driveway and thought I could still hear Helen Clark calling, Constance, Constance. She certainly wanted her tea, I said to Constance when she came back into the kitchen. We only have two cups with handles, Constance said. She'll never take tea here again. It's a good thing Uncle Julian's gone or one of us would have to use a broken cup. Are you going to need in Uncle Julian's room? Mary Cat, Constance turned from the stove to look at me. What are we going to do? We've eaten the house. We've had food. We've hidden from Helen Clark. What are we going to do? Where are we going to sleep? How are we going to know what time it is? What will we wear for clothes? Why do we need to know what time it is? Well, our food won't last forever, even the preserves. We can sleep in my hiding place by the creek. No, that's all right for hiding, but you must have a real bed. Hmm, I saw a mattress on the stairs. From my own bed, perhaps. We can pull it down and clean it and dry it in the sun. One corner is burned. Good, said Constance. We went together to the stairs and took hold of the mattress awkwardly. It was unpleasantly wet and dirty. We dragged it, pulling together along the hall with the little scraps of wood and glass coming in, and got it across Constance's clean kitchen floor to the kitchen door. Before unlocking the door, I looked out carefully, and even when the door was open, I went out first to look, around in every direction, but it was safe. We dragged the mattress out onto the lawn and put it in the sun near our mother's marble bench. Uncle Julian used to sit here, I said. It would be a good day today for Uncle Julian to sit in the sun. I hope he was warm when he died. Perhaps he remembered the sun a little. Hi there. I had his shawl. I hope he wish he I had his shawl. I hope he didn't wish for it. Mary Cat, I am going to plant something here where he used to sit. I'm going to bury something for him. What will you plant? A flower, Constance leaned, touching the grass softly. Some kind of a yellow flower. It's going to look funny right in the middle of the lawn. We'll know why it's there, and no one else will ever see it. And I will bury something yellow to keep Uncle Julian warm. First, however, my lazy Mary Cat, you will get a pot of water and scrub that mattress clean and I will wash the kitchen floor again. 
We were going to be so happy, I thought. There was a great many things to do, and a whole new pattern of days to arrange. But I thought we were going to be very happy. Constance was pale and still saddened by what they had done to her kitchen, but she scrubbed every shelf and washed the table again and again and washed the windows and the floor. Our, dirty, our, our dishes were bravely on their shelves, and the cans unbro and unbroken boxes of food we had rescued made a substantial row in the pantry. I could train Jonas to bring back rabbits for stew, I told her, and she laughed, and Jonas looked back at her blandly. That cat is so used to living on cream and rum cakes and buttered eggs that I doubt it could catch a grasshopper, she said. Well, I don't think I would care for grasshopper stew. And I told her, and she laughed. At any rate, right now, I'm going to make an onion pie. While Constance washed the kitchen, I found a heavy cardboard carton, which I took apart carefully, and so had several large pieces of cardboard to cover the glass window in the kitchen door. The hammer and the nails were in the tool shed where Charles Blackwood had put them after trying to mend the broken step and I nailed cardboard across the kitchen door until the glass was completely covered and no one could see it. I nailed more cardboard across the two kitchen windows and the kitchen was dark, safe. It would be safer to let the kitchen windows get dirty, I told Constance. She was shocked and said, I wouldn't live in a house with dirty windows. When we had finished, the kitchen was very bright and clean, but I could, but could not sparkle there because there was so little light and I knew that Constance was not pleased. She loved sunshine and brightness and cooking in a light, lovely kitchen. We can keep the door open, I said. We watch carefully all the time. We'll hear if any cars stop in front of the house. When I can, I said, I will try to think of a way to build barricades on the side of the house so that no one will be able to come around the back. Well, I'm sure Helen Clark will try again. Well, at any rate, she cannot look in now. The afternoon was drawing in. Even with the door open and the sunlight only came a short way across the floor, and Jonas came to Constance at the stove asking for his supper. The kitchen was warm and comfortable and familiar and clean. It would be nice to have a fireplace in here, I thought, where we could sit beside a fire, and then I thought, no, we've already had a fire. I will go and make sure that the front door is locked, I said. The front door was locked and no one was outside. When I came back into the kitchen, Constance said, Tomorrow I will clean Uncle Julian's room. We have so little house left that it should all be very clean. Will you sleep in there, in Uncle Julian's bed? No, Mary Cat, I want you to sleep in there. It's the only bed we have. I'm not allowed in Uncle Julian's room. She was quiet for a minute, looking at me curiously, and asked, Even though Uncle Julian's gone, Mary Cat, Besides, I found the mattress and I cleaned it and it came from my bed. I want to sleep on the floor in my corner. Silly Mary Cat. Anyways, I'm afraid we'll both have the floor tonight. The mattress will not be dry before tomorrow and Uncle Julian's bed is not clean. I can bring branches from my hiding place and leaves on my clean kitchen floor. I'll get a blanket though and Uncle Julian's shawl. You're going out now? All that way? No one's outside, I said. It's almost dark and I can go very safely. If anyone comes, close the door and lock it. And I'll see that the door is closed and I'll wait by the creek until I can come safely home. And I'll take Jonas as protection. I ran all the way to the creek, but Jonas was faster, waiting for me when I got to my hiding place. It was good to run and good to come back again to our house and see the kitchen door standing open and the warm light inside. When Jonas and I came in, I shut the door and bolted it, and we were both ready for the night. It's a good dinner, Constance said, warm and happy from cooking. Come and sit down, Mary Cat. With the door shut, she had to turn on the ceiling light, and our dishes on the table were neatly set. Tomorrow, I will try to polish the silverware, she said, and we must bring in things from the garden. The lettuce is full of ashes. Tomorrow, too, Constance said, looking at the black squares of cardboard which covered the windows. I'm going to try to think of some curtains to hide your cardboard. 
Tomorrow I will barricade the sides of the house. Tomorrow Jonas will catch us a rabbit. And tomorrow I will guess for you what time it is. Oh, I don't have any nails in my weightlifter. Far away, in front of the house, a car stopped, and we were very silent. Looking at one another now, I thought, now we, now we will know we are safe where we are. And I got up and I made sure that the kitchen door was bolted. I could not see out through the cardboard, and I was sure that they could not see in. The knocking started at the front door, but there was no time to make sure that the front door was locked. They knocked only for a moment as though certain that they would not be in front of the house. And then we heard s them stumbling in the darkness as they tried to wait, find their way around the side of the house to the back. I heard Jim Clark's voice, and another which I remembered was the voice of Dr. Levy. Can't see a thing, Jim Clark said. Black as sin out here. There was a crack of light at one of the windows. Which one, I thought, which window still showed a crack? They're in there, all right, Jim Clark said. No place else they could be. I just want to know if they're hurt or sick. I don't like to think of them shut up in there needing help. I'm supposed to bring them home with me, Jim Clark said. They came to the back door. Their voices were directly outside, and Constance reached out her hand across the table to me. It seemed as they might be able to look in, and we could run together for the cellar. If it seemed that they might be able to look in, we could run together toward the cellar. Damn place is all boarded up, Jim Clark said, and I thought, good, oh, that's good. I had forgotten that there would be real boards in the tool shed. I never thought of anything but cardboard, which might be too weak. Miss Blackwood, the doctor called, and one of them knocked on the door. Miss Blackwood, it's Dr. Levy, and Jim Clark, Helen's husband. Helen's very worried about you. Are you hurt? Sick? Do you need help? Helen wants you to come to our house. She's waiting for you. Listen, the doctor said, and I thought he had his face up very close to the glass, almost touching it. He talked in a very friendly voice and quietly. Listen, no one's going to hurt you. We're your friends. We came all the way over here to help you and make sure that you were all right. We don't want to bother you. As a matter of fact, we promise not to bother you at all, ever again, if you'll just say once that you're well and safe. Just say one word. You can't let just let people go on worrying and worrying about you, Jim Clark said. Just one word, the doctor said. All you have to do is say you're all right. They waited. I could feel them pressing their faces toward the, close to the glass, longing to see inside. Constance looked back at me across the table and smiled a little, and I smiled back. Our safeguards were good, and they could not see it. Listen, the doctor said, and he raised his voice a little. Listen, Julian's funeral is tomorrow. You thought you'd want to know. There are a lot of flowers already, Jim Clark said. You'll be really pleased to see all the flowers. We sent flowers, and the Wrights, and the Carringtons, and I think you'll feel a little different about your friends if you could see all the flowers sent to Julian. I wondered why we could feel different if we saw who sent them. I wondered why they thought we would feel different if we saw who sent Uncle Julian flowers. Certainly, Uncle Julian, buried in flowers, swarmed over by flowers, would not resemble the Uncle Julian we had seen every day. Perhaps masses of flowers would warm Uncle Julian dead, and I tried to think of Uncle Julian dead and could only remember him asleep. I thought of the Clarks and the Carringtons and the Wrights pouring armfuls of flowers down onto poor Uncle Julian, helplessly dead. You're not gaining anything by driving away your friends, you know. Helen said to tell you, Listen, I could feel them pushing towards the door. No one's going to bother you. Just tell us you're all right. We're not going to keep coming, you know. 
was a limit to how much friends can take. Jonas yawned. In silence, Constance turned slowly and carefully back to face her place at the table and took up a buttered biscuit and took a silent tiny bite. I wanted to laugh and put my hands over my mouth. Constance eating a biscuit silently was funny, like a doll pretending to eat. Damn it! Jim Clark said, and he knocked on the door. Damn it! For the last time, the doctor said, we know you're in there, and for the last time, will you just... Oh, come away, Jim Clark said. It's not worth the yelling. Hi there. Listen, the doctor said, and I thought he had his mouth against the door. One of these days, you're going to need help. You'll be sick or hurt. You'll need help. And then you'll be quick enough. Leave them be, Jim Clark said. Come on. I heard footsteps going around the side of the house, and I wondered if they were tricking us, pretending to walk away, and then coming back silently to stand without a sound outside the door, waiting. I thought of Constance silently eating a biscuit inside, and Jim Clark silently listening outside, and a little cold chill went up my back. Perhaps there would never be noise in the world again. And then the car started at the front of our house, and we heard it drive away. And Constance put her fork down on her plate with a little crash, and I breathed again, and said, Where have they got Uncle Julian, do you suppose? At that same place, Constance said absently, in the city, Mary Cat, she said, looking up suddenly. Yes, Constance. I wanted to say I'm sorry. I was wicked that night. I was still cold, looking at her, remembering. I was very wicked, she said. I never should have reminded you of why they all died. Then don't remind me now. I could not move my hand to reach over and take hers. I wanted you to forget about it. I never wanted to speak about it, ever, and I'm sorry that I did. I put it in the sugar. I know, I knew it then. You never used the sugar. No. So I put it in the sugar. Constance sighed. Mary Cat, she said, we'll never talk about it again. Never. And I was chilled, but she smiled at me kindly, and it was all right. I love you, Constance, I said. And I love you too, my Mary Cat. Jonas sat on the floor, and slept on the floor, and I thought it ought not be so difficult for me. Constance should have leaves and soft moss under her blanket, but we could not dirty her kitchen floor again. I put my blanket in the corner near the stool because it was, my, it was the place I knew best, and Jonas got up on the stool and sat there, looking down on me. Constance lay on the floor near the stove. It was dark, but I could see the paleness of her face across the kitchen. Are you comfortable? I asked her, and she laughed. I've spent a lot of time in this kitchen, she said, but I never before tried lying on the floor. I've taken such good care of it that it has made me welcome, I think. Tomorrow we bring in the lettuce. Chapter 10 Slowly the pattern of our days grew and shaped itself into a happy life. In the mornings when I awakened, I would go out once, go out at once down the hall to make sure everything, sorry. In the mornings when I awakened, I would go at once down the hall to make sure the front door was locked. We were most active in the early morning because no one was ever around. We had not realized that with the gates opened and the path exposed to public use, children would come. And one morning I stood beside the front door, looking out through the narrow pane of glass and saw children playing on our front lawn. Perhaps the parents had sent them to explore the way and make sure it was navigable, or perhaps children can never resist playing anywhere. They seemed a little uneasy playing in front of our house, and their voices were subdued. I thought that perhaps they were only pretending to play because they were children and they were supposed to play, but perhaps they were actually sent here to look for us, thinly disguised as children. They were not really convincing, I decided, as I watched them, they moved gracelessly, never once glanced, 
That I could see at our house. I wondered how soon they would creep onto the porch and press their small faces against the shutters, trying to see through the cracks. Constance came up beside me, or Constance came up behind me and looked over my shoulder. They're the children of strangers, I told her. Have no faces. They have eyes. Pretend they're birds. They can't see us. They don't, they don't know it yet. They don't want to believe it. They won't ever see us again. I suppose now that they've come once, they'll come again. All the strangers will come, but they can't see inside. Now may I please have my breakfast. The kitchen was dark in the morning, until I unbolted the kitchen door, and I opened to let the sunlight in. <laughs> then Jonas went to sit on the step and bathe, and Constance sang while she made our breakfast. After breakfast, I sat on the step with Jonas while Constance washed the kitchen. Barricading the sides of the house had been easier than I expected. I managed it in one night, with Constance holding a flashlight for me. At either side of our house, there was a spot where the trees and bushes grew close to the house, sheltering the back and the narrowing path. Sheltering the back and narrowing the path was the only way around. I brought piece after piece of the pile of junk Mr. Harler had made on our front porch, and I heaped the broken boards and furniture across the narrowest spots. It would not really keep anyone out, of course. The children could climb over it easily. But if anyone did try to get past there, there would be enough noise and falling of broken boards to give me plenty of time to close and bolt the kitchen door. I had found some boards across the tool around the tool shed and named them and nailed them rudely across the I had found some boards across around the tool shed and nailed them rudely across the glass of the kitchen door. But I disliked putting them across the sides of the house as a barricade, where anyone might see them and know how clumsily I built. Perhaps, I told myself, I might try my hand at mending the broken step. What are you laughing about now? Constance asked me. I am thinking that we are on the moon, but it is not quite as it should be. It is a very happy place, though. Constance was bringing breakfast to the table. Scrambled eggs and toasted biscuits and blackberry jam she had made some golden summer. We ought to bring in as much food as we can, she said. Don't like to think of the garden waiting there for us to come and gather growing things. And I'll feel much better if we had more food put away securely in the house. I will go on my winged horse and I'll bring you cinnamon and thyme, emeralds and clove, cloth of gold and cabbages. And rhubarb, she said. We were able to leave the kitchen door open when we went down to the vegetable garden because we could see clearly whether anyone was approaching my barricades and run back into the house if we needed to. I carried the basket and we brought back lettuce, still gray with ash, and radishes and tomatoes and cucumbers, and later berries and melons. Usually I ate fruit and vegetables, still moist from the ground and the air but I disliked eating anything while it was still dirty with the ash from our burned house. Most of the dirt and the soot had blown away, and the air around the garden was fresh and clean. But the smoke was in the ground, and I thought it would always be there. As soon as we were safely settled, Constance had opened Uncle Julian's room and cleaned it. She brought out the sheets from Uncle Julian's bed, and the blankets, and washed them in the kitchen sink, and set them outside to dry in the sunlight. What are you going to do with Uncle Julian's papers? I asked her, and she rested her hands against the edge of the sink, hesitating. I suppose I'll keep them in the box, she said at last. I suppose we'll put the box down in the cellar. And preserve it. And preserve it. He would like to think that his papers were treated respectfully. And I would not want Uncle Julian to suspect that his papers were not being preserved. I had better go to see that the front door is locked. Children were often outside our front lawn, playing their still games and not looking at our house, moving awkwardly in little dashing runs, slapping one another without cause. Whenever I checked to make sure that the front door was locked, I looked out to see if there were children there. Very often I saw people walking on our path now, using it to go from one place to another, and putting their feet down where once only my feet had gone. 
I thought they used the path without wanting to, as though each of them had to travel at once to show that it could be done. But I thought that only a few, defiant, hating ones, had come back more than once. I dreamed away the long afternoon while Constance cleared Uncle Julian's rooms. I sat on the door sill with Jonas asleep beside me and looked out onto the quiet safe bed. Look, Mary Cat, Constance said, coming to me with an armful of clothes. Look, Uncle Julian had two suits and a top coat and a hat. He walked upright once, he told us so himself. I can just barely remember him years ago, going off one day to buy a suit, and I suppose that it was one of these suits that he had bought. Neither of them are very much worn. What would he have been wearing on the last day with them? What tie did he have on at dinner? He would surely like to have had it remembered. She looked at me for a minute, not smiling. It would have hardly been one of these. When I came to get him afterwards, at the hospital, he was wearing pajamas and a robe. Perhaps he should have one of these suits now. It's probably buried in an old suit of Jim Clark's. Constance stared towards, started towards the cellar and then stopped. Mary Cat? Yes, Constance. Do you realize that these things of Uncle Julian's are the only clothes left in our house? All of mine are burned, and all of yours and everything of theirs is in the attic. I have only this pink dress that I have on. And I look down, and I'm wearing brown. And yours needs washing and mending. How can you tear your clothes so, Mary Cat? I shall wear a suit of leaves at once, with acorns for buttons. Mary Cat, be serious. You will have to wear Uncle Julian's clothes. I am not allowed to touch Uncle Julian's things. I shall have a lining of moss for cold winter days and a hat made of bird feathers. Well, that may be all very well for the moon, Miss Foolishness. On the moon, you may wear a suit of fur like Jonas, for all of me. But right here in our house, you are going to be clothed in one of your Uncle Julian's old shirts, and perhaps his trousers too. Or Uncle Julian's bathrobes and pajamas, I suppose. No, I'm not allowed to touch Uncle Julian's things. I will wear leaves. But you are allowed. I tell you, you are allowed. No. She sighed. Well, she said, you'll probably see me wearing them. And then she stopped and laughed and looked at me and laughed again. Constance, I said. She put Uncle Julian's clothes over the back of a chair and still laughing, went into the pantry and opened one of the drawers. I remembered what she was after and I laughed too. And then she came back and put an armload of tablecloths down beside me. These will do you very nicely, elegant Mary Cat. Look, how will you feel in this with a border of yellow flowers? Or this handsome red and white check? This damask, I'm afraid, is too stiff for comfort, and besides, it has to be darned. I have no sewing bit hurt. Hmm? Whoops. I stood up and held the red and white checkered tablecloth against me. You can cut a hole for my head, I said, and I was pleased. I have no sewing things. You will simply have to tie it around your waist with a cord or let it hang like a toga. I'll use the damask for a cloak. Who else wears a damask cloak? Merry cat, oh merry cat. Constance dropped the tablecloth she was holding and put her arms around me. What have I done to my baby Mary Cat, she said. No house, no food, and dressed in a tablecloth, what have I done? Constance, I said, I love you, Constance. Dressed in a tablecloth like a rag doll. Constance, we're going to be very happy, Constance. Oh, Mary Cat, she said, still holding me. Listen to me, Constance, we're going to be very happy. I dressed at once, not wanting to give Constance more time to think. I chose the red and white check, and when Constance had cut a hole for my head, I took my gold cord with the tassel that Constance had, hung, had cut from the drawing room drapes, and I tied it around me for a belt and I looked. I thought very fine. Constance was sad at first, 
and then she turned away sadly when she saw me, and scrubbed furiously at the sink to get my brown dress clean. But I liked my robe, and I danced in it, and before long she smiled again and laughed with me. Robinson Crusoe, dressed in the skins of animals, I told her. He had no, he had no gay clothes with a gold belt. Well, I must say you never looked so bright before. You will be wearing the skins of Uncle Julian. I prefer my tablecloth. I believe the one you are wearing now was used for summer breakfasts on the lawn many years ago. Red and white chef will never be used in the dining room, of course. Some days I shall be a summer breakfast on the lawn, and some days I shall be a former dinner by candlelight, and some days I shall be a very dirty merry cat. You have a very fine gown, but your face is dirty. We have almost lost everything, young lady, but at least we will have clean water and a comb. One thing was most lucky about Uncle Julian's room. I persuaded Constance to bring out his chair and wheel it through the garden to reinforce my barricade. It looked strange to see Constance wheeling the empty chair, and for a minute I tried to see Uncle Julian again, riding with his hands in his lap. But all that remained of Uncle Julian's presence were the worn spots on the chair and a handkerchief tucked under the cushion. The chair would be powerful in my barricade, however, staring out at the intruders with a blank menace of dead Uncle Julian. I was troubled to think that Uncle Julian might vanish altogether, with his papers in a box and his chair on the barricade and his toothbrush thrown away, and even the smell of Uncle Julian gone from his room. But when the ground was soft, Constance planted a yellow rose bush at Uncle Julian's spot on the lawn, and one night I went down to the creek and I buried Uncle Julian's initial gold pencil by the water so the creek would always speak his name. And Jonas took into going Uncle and Jonas took into Jonas took to going into Uncle Julian's room, where he had never gone before. I did not go inside. Helen Clark came to our door twice more, knocking and calling and begging for us to answer, but we sat quietly, and when she found that she could not come around the house because of my barricade, she told us from the front door that she would not come back, and she did not. One evening, perhaps the very evening of the day Constance planted Uncle Julian's rose bush, we heard a very soft knock at our front door while we sat eating at the table. Sorry. One evening, perhaps the evening of the day Constance planted Uncle Julian's rose bush, we heard a very soft knock at our front door while we sat at the table eating dinner. It was far too soft a knock for Helen Clark, and I left the table and hurried silently down the hall to be sure that the front door was locked, and Constance followed me, curious. We were pressed silently against the door, and I listened. Miss Blackwood? Someone said outside in a low voice, and I wondered if he suspected we were close to him. Miss Constance? Miss Mary Catherine? It was not dark outside, but where we stood, we could only see another... We could only see it. It was not dark outside, but inside where we stood, we could only see another dimly, see one another dimly, two white faces against the door. Miss Constance, he said, listen. I thought that he was moving his head from side to side to make sure that he was not seen. Listen, he said, I got a chicken here. And he tapped softly at the door. I hope you can hear me, he said got a chicken here. My wife fixed it, roasted it nice, and there's some cookies and pie. Hope you can hear me. I could see that Constance's eyes were wide with wonder. I stared at her and she stared at me. I sure hope you can hear me, Miss Blackwood. I broke one of your chairs and I'm sore. He tapped against the door again very softly. Well, he said, I'll just set this basket down here on your step. I hope you hear me. Goodbye. He listened to the quiet footsteps going away, and after a minute, Constance said, What shall we do? Shall we open the door? Later, I said. I'll come when it's really dark. I wonder what kind of pie it is. Do you think it's as good as my pies? We finished our dinner and waited until I was sure there was no... We finished our dinner and waited until I was sure no one could possibly see the front door opening. 
and then we went down the hall and I unlocked the door and looked outside. The basket sat on the doorstep, covered with a napkin. I brought it inside and locked the door while Constance took the basket from me and carried it into the kitchen. Blueberry, she said. Quite good. Still warm, too. She took out the chicken, wrapped in a napkin, and the little package of cookies, touching each lovingly with, and with gentleness. Everything's still warm, she said. She must have baked them right after dinner so, she could bring, so he could bring them right over. I wonder if she made two pies, one for the house. She wrapped everything while it was still warm and told him to bring them over. These cookies are not crisp enough. I'll take the basket back and leave it on the porch so he'll know we'll found, that we found it. No, no, Constance caught me by the arm. Not until I've washed the napkins. What would she think of me? Sometimes they brought bacon, home cured or fruit or their own preserves, which were never as good as the preserves Constance made. Mostly they brought roasted chicken, sometimes a cake or a pie, frequently cookies, sometimes a potato salad or a coleslaw. Once they brought a pot, stew, a pot of beef stew, which Constance took apart and put back together according to her own rules for beef stew. And sometimes there were pots of baked beans or macaroni. We are the best church supper they ever had, Constance said once, looking at a loaf of homemade bread that I had just brought inside. These things were always left on the front doorstep, always silently and in the evenings. We thought that the men came home from work and the women had the baskets ready for them to carry over. Perhaps they came in the darkness not to be recognized, as though each of them wanted, wanted to hide from the others. Bringing us food was somehow a shameful thing to do in public. But there were many women cooking. Constance said, here is one, she explained to me once, tasting a bean, who uses ketchup and too much of it. And the last one used more molasses. Once or twice there was a note in the basket. This is for the dishes, or we apologize for the curtains, or sorry for your heart. We always set the baskets back where we had found them, and never opened the front door until it was always completely dark, and we were sure that no one was near. I always checked carefully afterwards to make certain that the front door was locked. I discovered that I was no longer allowed to go to the creek. Uncle Julian was there, and it was far too much for Constance, and it was much too far from Constance. I'm sorry that it's cutting out again. This is very annoying. Why will it not just... Work. <laughs> Why did it disconnect? Come on, man. There, okay, it's back. So sorry if anyone's trying to watch and it just keeps disconnecting. It's a problem I've been having and I'm not sure how to fix it and I'm pretty sure it's 100% my internet connection because I am using it from school and they limit my upload, so... Very sorry. But we shall continue. I discovered that I was no longer allowed to go to the creek. Uncle Julian was there, and it was much too far from Constance. I never went farther away than the edge of the woods, and Constance went only as far as the vegetable garden. I was not allowed to bury anything anymore, nor was I allowed to touch stone. Every day I looked over the boards the across the kitchen windows, and when I found small cracks I nailed on more boards. Every morning I checked at once to make sure the front door was locked, and every morning Constance washed the kitchen. We spent a good deal of time at the front door, particularly during the afternoons when most people came by. We sat, one on either side of the front door, looking out through the narrow glass panels which I had covered almost entirely with cardboard so that we had only a small peephole and no one else could possibly see inside. We watched the children playing and the people walking past, 
and we heard their voices, and they were all strangers, with their wide staring eyes and their evil open mouths. One day a group came by bicycle. There were two women and a man, and two children. They parked their bicycles in our driveway, and lay down on our front lawn, pulling at the grass and talking while they rested. The children ran up and down our driveway, and over and around the trees and bushes. This was the day that we had learned the vines were growing over the burned roof of our house, because one of the women glanced sideways at the house, and said the vines almost hid the marks of burning. They rarely turned squarely to look at our house to look at our house face to face, but looked from the corners of their eyes, or from over a shoulder, or through their fingers. It used to be a lovely old house, I hear, said the woman sitting on the grass. I heard that it was a, quite a local landmark at one time. Hi there. Now it looks like a tomb, the other woman said. Shh first woman said, and gestured towards the house with her head. I heard, she said, they have a staircase which is very fine, very loudly. Carved in Italy, I heard. They can't hear you, the other woman said, amused. Who cares what they do anyways? Shh. No one knows for sure if there's anyone inside or not. The local people tell some tales. Shh, Tommy. She called to one of the children. Don't you go near those steps. Why? said the child, backing away. Because the ladies live in there and they don't like it. Why? said the child, pausing at the front pausing at the foot of the steps and giving a quick look backward towards it at our front door. The ladies don't like little boys, the second woman said. She was one of the bad ones. I could see her mouth from the side, and it was the mouth of a snake. What would they do to me? They'd hold you down and make you eat candy full of poison. I hear that dozens of bad little boys have gone too near that house and they've never been seen again. They catch little boys and they... Shh! Honestly, Ethel! Do they like little girls? The other children... The other child grew near. They hate little boys and little girls. The difference is, they eat little girls. Ethel, stop. You're terrifying the children. It isn't true, darlings. She's only teasing you. They never come out, except at night, the bad woman said, looking evilly at the children. And then when it's dark, they go hunting little children. Just the same, the man said suddenly. I don't want to see the kids going near the damn house. Charles Blackwood came back only once. He came in a car with another man late one afternoon when we had been watching for a long time. All the strangers had gone, and Constance had just stirred and said, Time to put on potatoes. When the car turned into the driveway, and she settled back to watch again. Charles and the other man got out of the car in front of the house and walked directly to the front steps, looking up, and although they could not see us inside. I remembered the first time Charles had come, stood looking up at our house in just the same manner, but this time he would never get in. I reached up and touched the lock on the front door just to make sure it was fastened, and on the other side of the doorway, Constance turned and nodded toward and nodded to me. She too knew that, Con that Charles would never get in again. See, Charles said, looking at the front at the foot of our steps. There's the house, just like I said. Doesn't look as bad as it did now that the vines have grown so. The roof's been burned away and the place is gutted inside. Are the ladies in there? Sure, Charles laughed, and I remembered his laughter and his big staring white face, and from inside of the door I wished him dead. They're in there, all right, and so is a whole damn fortune. You know that. They've got money in there that's never ever been counted. They got it buried all over, and a safe full, and God knows what else they're hiding. They've never come out, just hide inside away with all that money. Look, the other man said. They know you, don't they? Sure, I'm their cousin. Came here on a visit once. Do you think there's any chance you might get one of them to talk to you? Maybe come to the window or something so I could get a picture? Charles thought. He looked at the house and the other man and thought, If I sell this to the magazine or somewhere, do I get a half? Sure, it's a promise. I'll try it. Charles said. You get back behind the car, out of sight. 
certainly won't come out if they see a stranger. The other man went back to the car and took out a camera and settled himself on one side of the car where he could not be see where we could not see him. Okay, he called, and Charles started up the steps to the front door. Connie, he called. Hey Connie, it's Charles, I'm back. I looked at Constance and thought she had never seen Charles so truly before. Connie! She knew now that Charles was a ghost and a demon, and one of the strangers. Let's forget all that happened, Charles said. He came close to the door and smoke, spoke pleasantly, with a little pleading tone. Let's be friends again. I could see his feet. One of them was tapping, tapping on the front of the floor. One of them was tapping and tapping on the floor of our porch. I don't know what you got against me, he said, and I've been waiting and waiting to see for you to let me know the guy. I don't know what you've got against me, he said, and I've been waiting and waiting for you to let me know I could come back again. If I did anything to offend you, I'm really sorry. I wish Charles could see inside, he could see us sitting on the floor on either side of the front door listening to him and looking at his feet while he talked beggingly to the door three feet above our heads. Open the door, he said softly. Connie, will you open the door for me, Cousin Charles? Constance looked up to where his face must have been and smiled unpleasantly. I thought it might it must be a smile she'd been saving for Charles if he ever did come back again. I went to see old Uncle Julian's grave this morning, Charles said came back to visit old Julian's grave and to see you once more. Put a couple of flowers, you know, on the old fellow's grave. He was a fine old guy. He was always pretty good to me. Beyond Charles' feet, I saw the other man coming out from behind the car with his camera. Look, he called. You're wasting your breath, and I haven't got all day. Don't you understand? Charles had turned away from the door, but his voice still had a little break in it got to see her once more. I was the cause of it all. What? Why do you suppose two old maids shut themselves up in a house like this? God knows, Charles said. I didn't mean for it to turn out this way. I thought Constance was going to speak then, or at least laugh out loud, and I reached across to touch her arm, warning her to be quiet, but she did not turn her head toward me. I could just talk to her, Charles said. You can get some pictures of the house. Anyway, with me standing here, or knocking at the door, I'd be knocking frantically at the door. You could be stretched across the door still, dying of a broken heart for all of me, the other man said. And he went to the car and he put his camera inside. Waste of time. All that money, Connie, Charles said loudly. Will you for heaven's sake open the door? You know, the other man said from the car, I'll just bet you're never going to see those silver dollars again. Connie, Charles said, don't you know what you're doing to me? I never deserve to be treated like this. Please, Connie. You want to walk back, town, back into town? The other man said, and he clo closed the car door. Charles turned away from the door and then turned back. All right, Connie, he said, this is it. If you let me go this time, you're never seeing me again. I mean it, Connie. I'm leaving, the other man said from the car. I mean it, Connie. I really do. And Charles started down the steps, talking over his shoulder. Take a last look, he said. I'm going. One word could make me stay. Did not think he was going to go in time. I honestly did not know whether Constance was going to be able to contain herself until he got down the steps and safely into the car. Goodbye, Connie, he said from the foot of the steps and then turned away and walked slowly towards the car. He looked for a minute as though he might wipe his eyes or blow his nose, but the other man said, hurry up, and got into the car. Then Constance laughed and I laughed, and for a moment I saw Charles in the car turn his head quickly as though he had heard us laughing. But the car started and drove off down the driveway, and we held each other in the dark hall and laughed, with the tears running down our cheeks and our echoes of laughter going up to the ruined stairways into the sky. I am so happy. Constance said at last, gasping. Mary Cat, I am so happy. I told you that I would take you to the moon. Mm. 
The Carringtons stopped their car in front of our house one Sunday after church and sat quietly in the car, looking at our house, as though supposing we would come out if there was anything the Carringtons could do for us. Sometimes I thought of the drawing room and the dining room, forever closed away, with our mother's lovely broken things lying scattered, and the dust sifting gently down to cover them. We had new landmarks in our house, just as a new pattern for our days. The crooked, broken-off fragment which was all that was left of our lovely stairway was something we passed every day and came to know as intimately as we had once known the stairs themselves. The boards across the kitchen windows were ours, and part of our house, and we loved them. We were very happy, although Constance was always in terror lest one or two of the cups would break, and one of us would have to use a cup without a handle. We had our well-known familiar places, our chairs at the table, and our beds, and our places beside the front door. Constance washed the red and white tablecloth and the shirts of Uncle Julian which she wore, and while, we were hanging in, and while they were hanging in the garden to dry, I wore a tablecloth with a yellow border, which I looked very handsome with my gold belt. Our mother's old brown shoes were safely put away in a corner of the kitchen, and since the warm summer days I went barefoot like Jonas. Constance disliked picking many flowers, but there was always a bowl on the kitchen table with roses or daisies, although of course she never picked a rose from Uncle Julian's bush. I sometimes thought of my six blue marbles, but I was not allowed to go into the long field now, and I thought perhaps that my six blue marbles had been buried to protect a house which no longer existed and had no connection with the house where we live now, where we were very happy. My new magical safeguards were on the lock on the front door, and the boards over the windows, and the barricades along the sides of the house. In the evenings, sometimes we saw a movement in the darkness on the lawn and heard whispering, Don't! The ladies might be watching! You think they could see in the dark? I heard they see everything that goes on. Then there might be laughter drifting away into the warm darkness. They'll soon be calling this lover's lane, Constance said. After Charles, no doubt. The least Charles could have done, Constance said, considering seriously was to shoot himself through the head in the driveway. We learned from listening that all the strangers could see from outside when they looked at all was a great ruined staircase was the great was a great ruined structure overgrown with vines, barely recognizable as a house. It was the point halfway between the village and the highway, the middle spot on the path, and no one ever saw our eyes looking through the vines can't go on those steps, the children warned each other. If you do, the ladies will get you. Once, a boy, dared by the others, stood at the front of the steps facing the house, and shivered, and almost cried, and almost ran away, then called out shakily, Mary Cat, said Constance, would you like a cup of tea? And then fled down by the others. That night, we found on the door sill a basket of fresh eggs and a note reading, he didn't mean it, please. Poor child, Constance said, putting the eggs into a bowl to go into the cooler. It's probably hiding under the bed right now. Perhaps he had a good whipping to teach him manners. I will have an omelette for breakfast. I wonder if I could eat a child if I had the chance. Well, I doubt I could cook one, said Constance. Poor strangers, I said. They have so much to be afraid of. Well, Constance said, I'm afraid of spiders. Jonas and I will see that there are no spider ever comes near you. Oh, Constance, I said, we are so very happy. And that is the end. Oh. Again, as I've said before, I apologize so much for any and all of the times that the stream is cut out. Really trying to fix the issue that I'm having with Twitch or Streamlabs. I can stream on YouTube just fine and it's not ever a problem, but for whatever reason, it's harder for me here. Um, thanks again for tuning in, and if you want to stop by again next Sunday, we're starting a new book. Uh, somebody has requested that I do stories from Lovecraft, so I'm going to be starting with Dagon and some others. Um, and that'll be again starting at 2 on Sundays. 
Fridays is Folklore Fridays, where we're going to continue the Book of Norse Mythology with uh, Volume 3 of The Witch's Heart. Um, and I'm going to go and get something to eat, because I am very hungry. But once again, I thank everybody who tuned in, and if you want to keep up with the streams or you want to watch the videos again, I put them out on YouTube in a couple of days when I get finished editing them. So thanks again for tuning in, and I'll see you all next week.